Hello, this is Robert Beverly for CS4558 Network Traffic Analysis. This is the second lecture on IP geolocation. In large part, we're going to be talking about the Northwestern paper towards street level client independent IP geolocation. Some of the slides you'll see have been taken from the Northwestern folks. Let's talk about the problem and motivation. Following up from last time, one of the things that we saw were that there were many different ways of doing IP geolocation, and these different ways varied in their accuracy and the granularity in which they provided. So the question that we might ask is, how can we accurately locate IP addresses in the internet? We discussed last time that there are host-dependent solutions, such as using the GPS or the Wi-Fi. However, there are host-independent solutions. These are times when we might wish to find the geolocation of a device that we don't control and the device isn't willing to give us its actual location. So again, the server cannot always expect the client's cooperation. We discussed a little bit of prior work in the last lecture. Of note is the constraint-based geolocation. Some of the error that we've seen in prior papers, such as the TON 26-2006 paper, saw that CBG gives median error distances around 228 kilometers. There's been some work since then that involved using topology-based geolocation at IMC that was able to do both CBG as well as incorporating network topology as part of the constraints to give a median error closer to 67 kilometers. Even more recently, some of the work from NSDI in the Octant system was able to produce median errors of the range of 35.2 kilometers. So work has been progressing in improving the accuracy of IP geolocation. However, it's interesting to note that there may be certain problems where even error of 35.2, median error of 35.2 kilometers, is simply too much. And remember that this is a median error, and sometimes these distributions have errors with very long tails. This paper, and in large part this lecture, investigates some new techniques for doing street-level IP geolocation, so very fine-grained geolocation i.e. getting down to the street level. Again, recall that different applications that require geolocation are going to require different levels of granularity. So if we're talking about doing geo walls, for instance, if we're the BBC iPlayer, it may be sufficient to simply be able to provide country level IP geolocation. So when might we be interested in much finer grained IP geolocation? Certainly, we can envision different military applications where we would like to know precisely the location of a particular target. Similarly, in the last lecture, we talked about emergency services. Again, this is an application where we would like to have street-level geolocation. What about in the commercial space or in the advertising space? Certainly, that's the approach, or at least the motivation, that's given in the Northwestern paper. Here is a picture of a uh, of Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, where, for instance, there are many different businesses that all provide a certain service. So let's say, for instance, that the user is this green triangle, and the user is searching, or perhaps advertisers, which wish to provide advertisements for their business, and say that the business is a donut shop. Well, there may be literally hundreds of different donut shops within a 35-kilometer radius. So the advertiser would love to know more fine-grained street-level geolocation so that the advertiser could, for instance, make an advertisement for this donut shop labeled B or H or C pop up on the user's device. <clears throat> so the question we might ask is, can constraint-based IP geolocation techniques, CBG again, provide this level of fine-grained accuracy? Last time, we talked about CBG and also the error inherent in CBG. So recall that some of the sources of error include circuitous routing, last mile effects, i.e. due to things like the DSL or due to the cable modem, the number of landmarks, 
and the location of these landmarks. Remember, the landmarks are what are giving us these feasible regions, and on the right here, we see several of these feasible regions, and the intersection of these actually provides the feasible region for where the target is located. So one of the fundamental properties of CBG, an error in CBG, is that the prediction accuracy when making a location excuse me, making a location prediction is proportional to the closest landmark to the target. So if, for instance, the target is in a country where we have no landmarks, the error is going to be quite high. Conversely, if we have a landmark that is very close to the target, the error is going to be quite low. So what we'd like to do is to obtain as many uh, different landmarks as possible and also obtain landmarks that are close to the target. This is one of sort of the fundamental insights uh, that this paper makes. So let's talk about landmarks in a little bit more detail. So recall that to use a landmark we must first know its location and then second we must be able to source active probes from that landmark. If we know its location and we can source active probes, then we can get RTTs. If we can get RTTs to the target, we can uh, get a latency estimation that allows us to estimate the distance and then allows us to obtain these constrained regions. So the question again is, how can we obtain more of these landmarks? And how can we obtain landmarks closer to the target? The insight in this paper is twofold. One is that there are websites public websites that typically publish their actual geolocation. How can we use that information? Well, we'll talk about it in a second. And further, if we're able to locate where a particular website is hosted, how can we use that website as a landmark? And what we're going to see in this paper is the ability to use them as what's known as a passive landmark as opposed to an active landmark. First, let's, we're going to talk about each of these uh, properties in turn, but first let's talk about websites publishing location information. What I'm going to do now is go to the NPS website with the browser. So I'm going to enter www.nps.edu, and if I scroll down to the bottom here, I'm going to see that in fact there's an address here, One University Circle in Monterey, California. So that's interesting, and this is typical of many, many different websites. Often websites will have a contact us or a different kind of link, but invariably there will be some actual meet space physical location for a particular website. Not only that, but Google often knows these kinds of locations. So say, for instance, that we want to find landmarks that are constrained to be within a particular area. So let's say that we know that the target is in the United States, or we know that the target is within California. Well, it would be great to find landmarks that are in that area. And in fact, one of the things that this paper shows is that we can simply Google and use Google as our database for finding such websites, which allows us to find landmarks. For instance, we might be able to Google for schools, governments, or businesses within a particular zip code. As an example, I went to a uh, school in Ohio. So if I Google for school, and then I'm going to give uh, my actual zip code here, 43221, and I Google for school 43221. Well, what I'm going to get back here is, in essence, ah, here it is. Here's a link to something called Upper Arlington Schools. And if I click on this, I'm going to see that, in fact, here's a website. And if I look at the address, it says, yep, Upper Arlington Schools, 1950 North Malway Drive in Upper Arlington, Ohio, 43221. So now I have a website that I believe to be in this zip code. Of course, many of you will be thinking, is that a particular website actually hosted in the zip code 43221? Is it physically in that zip code? Because we know that frequently, websites are hosted on what we call shared uh, hosting infrastructure. So let's talk about that problem for a moment. So the intuition here is that shared hosting services are companies 
And these companies will serve many different websites using a single IP address and a single server. So what we would like to do is to be able to determine for a given website whether that site is hosted on a shared hosting service or a dedicated web host. If it's a dedicated web host, it's much more likely that in fact that server is physically located <coughs> at the location that we can find on the website. Let's take a moment to think again about how shared hosting works. Multiple websites have the same IP address. So when we go to www.example.com, that might resolve via the DNS A record to the same address as www.bob.com or www.rob.com. So how does the server that's receiving the HTTP GET request actually know which website you're requesting? How does it know which content to actually serve up? Well, what happens is that in the HTTP 1.1 protocol, there is a required header. This required header is called host. And what host requires is uh, actually the name of the website that we're trying to uh, retrieve. So the methodology that's used in this paper and others is to send the HTTP GET query first to uh, the IP address using the host header of the actual name of the website we're trying to get, like www.example.com, and then do a separate query, but this time using host with the IP address. And then we'll compare the content results. If it's a dedicated host, we might expect the content to be the same, but if it's shared hosting, we might expect to get different content. Let's do an example of this. So here, what I'm going to do, so let me do this. I will do uh, another example. So I'll do government 43221. And I'll see here, for example, the city of Upper Arlington. What I'm trying to show here is that there are many, many different websites that we might be able to use. So let's go to the city of Upper Arlington's website. And if we go to this website, yep, here's another thing that uh, claims to be in 43221. So let's figure out if it actually is. So here is the uh, actual name of this website, www.uaoh.net, uh, upperarlington.ohio. And here I'm on one of my servers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell net to this uh, actual host. This is so that I can see the data. You can do the same thing using a web browser. Um, here, I'm just trying to make it a little bit more easy to see what's going on. So if I tell that to this web host, uh, actually what I see is that I get uh, an IPv6 address. That's kind of cool. So I'm going to ask for the uh, root URL using HTTP 1.1. And I'm going to say host here is, oh, I didn't do it fast enough. Okay, get slash HTTP 1.1. And I'm going to say host is this, and I get a big, big web page with lots of different stuff. And here I can see site design and content, Upper Arlington, Ohio, so on and so forth. So I'm getting the actual HTML from that web page. So let's try this again, but this time I'm not going to specify the host parameter. I'm going to give the address. So I'm going to do git slash HTTP 1.1, and I'm going to say host. And then this time, I'm going to put this IP address. In this case, it's an IPv6 address. And if I do that, I get something back that's completely different. Here it says Cloudflare. Cloudflare. And it says your IP address. Uh, and it says here that, uh, right, if you are interested in learning more about Cloudflare, please visit our website. And so what we see here is that we know for a fact that this Upper Arlington website that is a candidate to be in zip code 43221 is in fact likely not in zip code 43221 because in fact what happens is if we don't specify that uaoh.net in the host portion of the HTTP header, what we get back is a URL 
uh, we get back content for that URL that says it's part of Cloudflare. So we get back different content, and one of the things that I happen to know is that Cloudflare is actually part of a CDN, or a content distribution network. So it's almost certain, in fact it is certain, that this UAOH.net is not physically in 43221. It's part of a web hosting service. So if a user is interested in, uh, a viewer, I'm sorry, is interested in trying this for the nps.edu uh, website, you'll get a different answer. What you'll see is that if you access the website via its IP address, you'll get the same content as if you access the website via its name. So the viewer can try this at home. So that's this paper's technique for identifying shared hosting. Next, what we'd like to do is, once we've identified uh, passive landmarks, again, the example I just gave would, be a, would not be a viable landmark because we don't know actually where it is. We don't know its actual location. But once we have identified landmarks, such as www.nps, which is physically at NPS, and we know which zip code it's actually in, and we can verify that via our shared versus dedicated hosting trick, what we'd like to do is to be able to use it as a landmark, right? So what we're going to do is the following, and I have an illustration of all of this in a minute, so please try to uh, you know, wait a second. Um, I'm going to explain it and then show a picture of it where it will make more sense, okay? But what we'd like to do is to have from a set of vantage points uh, that we can source active probes from, we're gonna run two trace routes. We're gonna run a trace route first to the target, the thing that we're trying to geolocate, and then we're gonna run the second trace to the passive landmark. This is the website that I've identified its geolocation. What we're gonna do is recall that Traceroute provides per hop RTT latency estimates. What does that mean? So when you run Traceroute, you get each hop uh, as an IP address, and this is the interface of the router on the uh, forward path towards the target. And for each hop, we get an RTT from our vantage point to that hop. What that means is that I can subtract these latencies from any two hops to get the estimate of the latency between those two hops. Next, because of the tree-like structure of the network, there's going to be some router, I'm going to call it R, where these two trace route paths diverge. If you think about it, if you trace route from your house, say I'm at, uh, I'm I live uh, here in the Monterey area, and if I run a trace route uh, to something at, uh, say, Boston College in Boston, and I run that from my Comcast network at home, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through several, several Comcast hops, then I'm going to go across the country and eventually get to Boston. So if I trace route to Stanford and I trace route to Boston College, the first couple of hops out of my network are typically the same. So what we're saying is that there's some router at which point the two trace route paths diverge. They start taking different paths, but frequently the first couple of hops will be the same, or sometimes even more. It depends on how close the target and the passive landmark actually are. So we're gonna do this trick of estimating latency by uh, doing the subtraction of RTTs. So we're gonna estimate the latency between the divergent router and the landmark, and we're gonna call that latency D1. And then we're gonna estimate the latency between uh, the router and the target. We're gonna call that latency D2. Finally, we're going to get an estimate of the landmark to target latency as the sum of D1 and D2. And we're going to see that this actually provides an upper bound on what that latency could be. So it's, in essence, a conservative latency estimate. So here's a picture of everything that I just said. There's three objects here. The first is the vantage point. This is the thing that I control and that I can run traceroute from. There's this circle, which is my passive landmark. This is the website with a known geolocation. And then, but I, it's a known geolocation, but I can't source probes from the landmark. And then the third is the triangle, and this is the target. This is the thing that I'm trying to IP geolocate. So first, I'm going to run a trace route to the target. This is going to expose several hops 
IP router hops along the way the forward path from the vantage point to the target. Next, I'm going to run a trace route to the landmark. What we see here is that the first three hops are the same, and then the trace route diverges. So we're going to call this divergent router R, and I've shaded it in this picture. The next thing that I'm going to do is estimate this latency from R to the landmark. And again, the way I can do this is by taking the RTT estimate from the vantage point to the landmark minus uh, the RTT less, uh, estimate from the vantage point to R, which will give me the estimate of the landmark to R latency. I'm going to play the same trick to get a latency estimate from R to the actual target, the thing I'm trying to geolocate. And then I'm going to estimate the overall latency from the landmark to the target as D1 plus D2. Note that this is an upper bound because the landmark and the target could be physically next to each other or they could uh, or they could be uh, further apart. So they could be uh, right next to each other or they could be 180 degrees away from each other. So this is an upper bound. It's a conservative estimate. But that's okay, right? So even if we have error in this process or even if we have a landmark and our estimate of where it physically is via this website method is wrong, it doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because we're going to do this for many different landmarks, this process that I've shown in this picture. We're going to do it for many different landmarks and many different vantage points. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the minimum of the estimated latency. So we're going to find uh, the landmark that's going to minimize the distance to the target. All right, so next, a case study. So here what we've got is an example from the authors of this paper. The prior slides were my own, now we're switching to some of the slides from the Northwestern authors. So here is a target IP address and the uh, target postal address. So the overall system that the Northwestern researchers created has three tiers. I'm going to run through each tier. The first tier uh, uses standard CBG or constraint-based geolocation. And the idea of these tiers is that each tier is going to sort of winnow us down to a more fine-grained location. So first, tier one is the coarse-grained region. So this is the thing, the technique, we're going to use CBG, and we're going to get errors on the order of, you know, hundreds of kilometers, all right? But still, we can get it down to a particular region. So here, what we're going to do is use the available vantage points we have to run pings to the target to create these circles that you see in the picture, we're going to do that from many different vantage points, and when we do it from many different vantage points, we take the latencies that we observe, convert them into a geographic distance, and then form these circles. The intersection of these circles here is drawn in red, and that is the feasible region given by all of these constraints. So we create the intersection. Okay, next is Tier 2. So Tier 2 says, let's use these passive landmarks. So these are the landmarks that we just saw a few slides ago that are websites that we know to be in a particular location and we're going to use this method of running the trace routes in order to uh, get a latency estimate from these passive landmarks to the target. Remember, the reason we don't simply run ping from the passive landmarks is that we can't. These are websites that aren't under our control. So we're going to use passive landmarks to determine the finer grained region for the targeted IP. So what we're going to do, we've zoomed in now. This is a zoom in of uh, what was found in Tier 1. So Tier 1 gave us that red intersection area. The next thing that we're going to do is find landmarks that lie within that feasible region. How are we going to find passive landmarks? Well, we're going to use that same technique of using Google that we discussed before. We know what zip codes are in a particular region, at least in the United States. In other regions of the world, there are different uh, ways of doing this. And that's something interesting to talk about, uh, is how accurate would this be in other parts of the world, say Turkey, or maybe even more remote places. 
So when we do this, we're going to populate this area with landmarks. So we're going to find web servers that are businesses, schools, government, so on and so forth, that are actually dedicated servers, we believe, that are within this region. And then we're going to use this technique of estimating the delay between the landmarks and the targets. This is the figure from the paper. This is the same thing that I just showed when we were using the technique of running trace routes to get the latency estimates. Here is an example that shows that uh, in this case, from two different vantage points, we run from vantage point one, the divergent, we run a trace route to the target and the landmark, and the point at which they diverge is R1. When we run the same kind of method from vantage point V2 to the target and the landmark, we diverge at point uh, R2. The divergent router is R2. In this case, the sum of D1 plus D2, that's our estimate of the latency between R1 and the landmark, plus the latency between R1 and the target, that sum is less than the latency estimate of D3 plus D4. So in this case, we would use D1 plus D2, and we would use the landmark uh, that is uh, up in the corner. The estimate would be D1 plus D2 to the target. This is an example of how I said we'll use many different landmarks, we'll use many different vantage points to obtain uh, as many feasible close landmarks as possible. Doing this makes the whole system more resilient to errors in the process when we mislabel a web server. So once we get these new delays between the passive landmarks and the target, we can play the same CBG type trick. So now we can create a new intersection. So next we're going to go on to tier three. And the fundamental insight of tier three is that once you get very close uh, to the particular destination, so once you have a landmark that's close to the target, the problem here is that recall before we made this estimate about latency and its relationship to distance. Well, it turns out that when you're close to the target, that latency estimate uh, doesn't well represent distance. Why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is, for instance, there might be two, uh, two the uh, landmark and the target might be physically next to each other, but perhaps they're on separate networks. So they have different providers. So what this might mean is that the packet has to go all the way back to, say, um, a big exchange point in order to get just uh, you know, to the server next door. This can drastically influence, as a relative percentage, uh, the estimate of uh, distance based on latency. Similarly, we talked about the role of uh, last, the last mile role. So, the role that these devices such as cable modems uh, play in delay. And in fact, whereas the, uh, the core of the network is typically very fast and typically very uncongested, the edge is often slow, it's congested, and the access technologies often have built-in latency because of the way they work. So here, the idea is that instead of using absolute network delays, meaning taking that delay and using the speed of light, to, uh, to convert the propagation delay into actually a distance, we're not going to use absolute delays. We're going to use relative network delays. What do, we mean, what do we mean by relative? We mean by relative that we can just simply get a rank ordering over the delay. So here, we're going to take uh, the delay to the target. Again, the target is this green uh, triangle. And we're going to find the latency from A to the target, the latency from J to the target, the latency from E to the target, D, F, so on and so forth, and we're going to rank order them. In this case, A is less than J is less than D is less than B. And so what we see here is that uh, A, we can say, is closest. We're not trying to convert it into an actual distance, we just believe relative to the other delays that it's closest. And it's similarly, J is uh, is second closest. So J is closer than D, and A is closer than both J and D. So what we're going to do in tier three is simply play this kind of trick. Again, we've got a new constrained region. The new constrained region came from tier three. 
We're again going to use the Googling trick to populate that region with passive vantage points. And now what we're going to do is just get the latency estimate, but use the relative delays. Finally, we're going to simply select the landmark out of this entire set that has the minimum delay. And we're going to say that the target is actually located there. So in this case, this particular case study, it turns out that this landmark that's across the street from the target actually has the lowest relative delay. So even though the apps, uh, if we were to do the conversion, if we looked at the latency between that dot and that triangle, it actually uh, places them uh, tens of kilometers apart. But in fact, they're across the street. So this is why we use the relative delay. Here's a picture of that relationship to give you some intuition. Uh, what we see here on the uh, x-axis is the geographical distance in kilometers, so from 100 up to 600 kilometers, and then we look at the measured distance. So this is way off in terms of using the speed of light conversion, but the point that this picture is trying to make is that the relationship is roughly linear, right? And this means that we can use the relative comparison. So measured distance is proportional to geographic distance. So that's the technique used in the street level client independent geolocation paper. The next part of their paper goes into the evaluation of the system. To evaluate the system, they utilized three data sets. They used the Planet Lab data set. This is an academic data set, a residential data set collected, um, and an online maps data set from the wild. So let's, let's talk about these data sets really quickly. It's first important to note that while we've seen Planet Lab in other lectures, and we've seen Planet Lab used for many different systems, it's important to note here that the Planet Lab, in this case, these devices, the Planet Lab servers, are actually the targets. So these are not the vantage points, these are not the passive landmarks, but these are the targets. So why did they use Planet Lab as targets? Well, for a very simple reason. It's because the Planet Lab targets have well-known locations. They have ground truth so that they can evaluate the accuracy of their system. The residential data set here, the second data set, this was basically a friends and family data set. So if you read into the paper a little bit more carefully, you'll see that it's a fairly small data set. There were not that many different uh, devices in this particular uh, data set. So in fact, they got 231 IP address location pairs. It's always important to sort of keep in mind what the data is and to be skeptical about some of the findings based on the data. Finally, the online maps data set. So what is that? So first of all, the thing to note on this paper is that one of the co-authors is from Microsoft Research. So what happened here is that it turns out that when people use map services, so for instance, if I say, if I'm um, at my house and I use a, a mapping service, I'll say, give me directions from my house to, say, uh, Legoland, or give me directions from my house to the airport. Well, when you do this, if you look at all of the searches for the maps database, and if you look at the most common either source or destination of those searches, the most common is your house, right? So I'm always getting directions either to or from my house when I'm running uh, map queries. So what they do here is that when they have map queries, so when someone asks for uh, directions, and someone asks the Microsoft system for directions, what they look at is the most common uh, source or destination physical location, and then they map that, associate that to the IP address making that query. So this is a way to get a large number of known IP geolocation address pairs. Now, the question here is, how big is this data set? Or at least that's a natural question. Or how representative is it? Unfortunately, because this is a Microsoft data set, they don't release any details of it. Um, and so it's impossible to know. So again, we have to be somewhat skeptical about this. Furthermore, I mentioned earlier about how well this type of system that the authors have come up with might work in other countries such as how well it would it work in the Middle East? How well it would it work in Asia? How well would it work in Europe? 
Well, we don't know because none of this actually was done in any of those places. It was all done in the United States where things uh, in some sense are easier. So some of the factors that can impact the accuracy are the landmark density. So for instance, if I'm trying to geolocate something in uh, the middle of nowhere, Utah, this is gonna be much harder to find servers that are hosted out in Utah. Um, the population density and the type of access network. So the first thing to look at is in terms of the characteristics of the data set, here's a CDF of uh, the population density measured as people per square mile for the three different data sets. So we've got the Planet Lab, the residential, and the online maps. And what the authors are trying to say here is that the data sets cover both urban and rural areas. So here, where we have a large population density, <clears throat> there are uh, data points in areas that range from 100 to 100,000 people per square mile. However, it's important to look at this CDF, and we see that this urban area really represents close to, you know, 20% of the entire data. When we look at the rural areas, there's definitely fewer for Planet Lab and Residential, and there's definitely uh, more for the online maps, but there's not that many. So we don't have as many data points in rural areas. So what were the results from the authors? Here's sort of the main takeaway that the authors want us to see. This is the error distance in kilometers for the three different uh, data sets using their system, and this is a CDF. So here what we see is uh, both the uh, median and the maximum error. So for the Planet Lab data set, the median error was less than a kilometer. For the residential, it was uh, 2.25 kilometers, and for online maps, about two kilometers. So this compares to the previous best result, the octant work from uh, NSDI, that had 35 kilometers. Now, again, putting our skeptical hat back on, if we look at Planet Lab, this looks like an amazingly good result. But is it really? One of the reasons I say that is because what's likely happening here, if we look at where Planet Lab nodes are actually hosted, they're hosted at academic universities, places like NPS or Carnegie Mellon or MIT or Stanford. And what's generally happening here is that those same places, those same universities often have a web server that hosts the CS department's uh, website. And that server is physically located probably in the same hallway or at least the same building as those Planet Lab servers. So for Planet Lab, it's very easy to imagine that we're able to find landmarks that are very, very close to the actual Planet Lab servers. So when I see this result, it's impressive, but we certainly have to take it with the grain of salt. The residential data set is still impressive uh, again, but the problem here is that there's so few IP addresses. There's only 231, and there's not very many different uh, providers represented within that data set. And then finally, the online maps data set, we have no idea because, of course, they don't produce any details of this data set. But it's still a cool technique, and these are still cool results especially when we look at the maximum error, right? So before the previous maximum error for the best system was on the order of 276 kilometers for Planet Lab and it's five kilometers and for online maps, it's only 10 kilometers. So here they've definitely made a contribution where they're able to increase the accuracy. We can also look at uh, the role of population density. So how does the error distance, the amount of error in the de distance <coughs> estimation vary with the population density of where the target actually is? We can see here that in fact, the uh, error goes up as the population goes down. However, it's fairly well bounded. We see that even when we get down to the minimum population density represented within the data set, we still only get down to like 12 kilometers error. But it is the case that the closer we are, or sorry, that the higher the population density that the target resides in, the better this system does. Finally, we can look at the role of access networks. So when we look at this residential data set, they divided it up into AT&T, Comcast, and Verizon. And we see some very, very different behaviors. 
For instance, it's interesting to note that Comcast, which is in this case using a system that has, uh, it's a shared, you can think of the, the cable as a uh, shared bus that has some contention on it, so there are multiple subscribers that are connected to the same cable, we see here that in fact the distribution of errors is higher, as opposed to some of the other systems that use DSL. So here we see 700 meters, and here we see two kilometers. So cable access networks such as Comcast have much larger latency variants than DSL networks such as AT&T and Verizon. We could do a whole lecture on this and the different kinds of access technologies, but I'll save that to another lecture. So finally, this paper, in my mind, presents a really cool set of techniques. Um, it shows us how, first of all, fundamentally, the error that we obtain is going to be proportional to the number of vantage points, but not just the number of vantage points, but how close the nearest vantage point is to the target. So this fundamental property they, they use as an insight to say, okay, let's actually find uh, landmarks that are closer. But how can we do that when we don't control the landmarks? Well, we're going to use these tricks of using uh, websites with locations, of finding uh, shared versus dedicated hosting, and then using the trace route to estimate the latency. So this is really cool, and they've demonstrated the ability to get to street-level IP geolocation. Finally, I'll note that the advisor on this paper from Northwestern, Alexander, has started a company based on these techniques. Hopefully, he'll do well. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.